Welcome to the first episode of The Clayton Perspective, a new podcast where I interview Clayton Wicca and we talk about and analyze works of literature. Hello, Clayton Wicca. How are you? I am fine, Thomas Chaboder. How are you? I'm doing pretty great. So today's Sunday, the 15th of November. Uh, we're about seven months into quarantine. It's pretty great. If you're watching this, uh, either, either, there are two scenarios that happened. This show became big, and now there are a bunch of people that are like going back in time and looking at previous Clayton Perspective episodes, or uh, you're Mrs. LeClaire or someone from our English class looking at um, Clayton and my uh, little project here. Uh, or you're a family or friend member that we forced to watch it just to validate our efforts. Exactly, exactly. So the gist of this podcast episode one, this is episode one, we're going to be looking at different pieces of literature, some new, some old, this one's new, uh, I haven't shown this to Clayton yet, I've picked it out for him, and I'm going to be showing it to him, and we're going to get his first impressions, and we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on in the book. You ready, Clayton? Yes. Okay, cool. So I'm going to read this, uh, this book that I picked out, this is called Social Distance, a graphic short story for the coronavirus age by Mark Haddon. I'm going to give you the background for this story after I read it. I just want to hear you, like, I just want to get your first impression of the actual story before I tell you a bit of the background, okay? All right. So, Social Distance. I've been socially distant for the last 20 years. It's not something I've chosen. People just seem to avoid me. They think I'm talking to myself. They're wrong. I'm talking to other people. I just don't know if they're real. If you don't count nurses and the boys who pushed me into the river, the last time I touched another person was in 2008. I forget her name. She was a bit overweight, but she had really nice eyes. Mostly, I just stay in the flat. So the lockdown should feel like normal life. But the virus is frightening. And the news is even worse. I do love how clear and blue the sky is. The quietness and the empty streets. Last week, I saw a deer by the co-op. I haven't seen a deer since I was a boy. We stared at each other for a long time before it trotted away. I see it everywhere now. I think it's protecting me. Is that such a stupid thing to think? And that's the end. Clayton, what do you think of this piece? I think it's bizarre, surreal, and very heavily interpretable. Interesting. That's why I picked it. Uh, I was looking for something to give you that was related to what's going on in the world today, but also was just just really strange. And and this is a perfect piece to go over in a in a literary analysis podcast. I think, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. It, it's definitely relevant. It's definitely yeah. I, I think it's a great choice. Okay. So I wanted to give you some background on this piece now, now that we've, we've kind of, we've read it and you've thought about it a little bit. Right. Um, this piece was written by someone named Mark Haddon, and, uh, and I wanted to share with you this quote that I have of him. It says, I've been putting stories and pictures together for a long time, from the children's picture books I wrote and illustrated in my 20s, through Curious Incident, to the illustrated edition of The Pier Falls. Those are other works of his. But this is the first time I've written a story for adults in which the pictures do the heavy lifting. Really, really fascinating quote by him. He lives in the UK. I don't know if I mentioned that. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, there you go. That explains the use of the word flat. Exactly. Right, right, right. Okay, so uh, I wanted to get your initial thoughts. Um, just, uh, just like what stood out to you about this piece? Uh, I, it, it's a very interesting 
uh, concept, the art is very distinct. Um, and I, I get kind of confusing messages from this. Yeah. Because it makes me wonder, like, wh who is this guy? Right, 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 right. But how is it that you've not touched anybody except for nurses and, it, you know, maybe he's... Yeah. Maybe he's like a bubble boy. Maybe he's, you know, <laughs> maybe he's like super immunocompromised and he can't interact with people normally. And that's why the virus is so scary to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the the whole piece is just, um, it, it happens very fast and there's not a lot of words there. Um, I wanted to first talk a little bit about the art style you mentioned right. that a little bit um if you look we're looking at look at just the first picture uh i'm noticing a couple things um we've got some they're kind of scribbly black in the background you see that yeah. for the wall or maybe shadows mm -hmm. um look at the fingers um i mean you know it's it's not a it's not like it's not, it's not going for realism here. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, it's um, not artfully done. And then I'd like to point out the, the it looks like magazine paper cutouts. And this is something yeah. that I didn't notice on my first reading. But it's fascinating. If you look through this thing, you can see pieces of magazine cut out and used for various objects. Like this cup here. Okay, I don't know if this is for Pepsi or something. Dress on the train. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Look at that. That's crazy. Um, what do you think? Why? Just why? Why do you think? Why? And, and what, what's the reasoning behind this? Why would someone want to do this? Well, I, I think it's a very um, astute decision to make because I think it portrays a sense of shoddiness. And I think that this character's life is kind of you know, ramshackle piece together. He's just kind of passing f for existing. Yeah, yeah, I feel that. And that's what a lot of this artwork just, it's, it's just passing for representing the thing that he needs to represent. Like, you can just tell that this character wears glasses and you can just tell that these are people and that they're on a train, right? And it's kind of, there are certain aspects of the life that are like, they, they really shouldn't be there, but they're there, right? Like all the magazine cutouts. And I think it's, it's done in a way that conveys the, the way in which the character lives. Because, mm -hmm. you know, he probably doesn't live a super clear, well-defined life. Yeah. He probably lives, you know day to day on something and it, it's all just kind of pieced together maybe he's got a, a couch that he picked up off the sidewalk and a, a 30 year old television and you know some hand-me-down clothes and stuff and... yeah i just feel disoriented looking at these uh, these pictures like sometimes it's it's even hard to tell exactly what's going on in the picture um yeah, like like the picture where it, um when it the with the lines I, la I last week I saw a deer by the co-op. Mhm. Mm which right? we'll talk about. We'll talk about that. Yeah, but like the it, it's just this bizarre street and yeah. sidewalk where the sidewalk is made up of different clippings of sidewalk and then the the co-op sign is just an actual image of the co-op sign. And yeah. It's almost it, Escher-esque. Yeah, yeah, it's it's surreal and bizarre, but it, it conveys a very vivid emotion. Mm. I also want to ask you, in relation to this specific work of literature, why would the author choose illustrations? He could have, he could have just written this as a poem. He also could have fleshed it out and described each scene with words, why in this scenario did do you think that he used pictures? 
You know, it is often said fondly and sometimes with a bit of sarcasm that an image is worth a thousand words, mm -hmm. right? And I, I mean, it, it's kind of a, a dead horse at this point to say that, but I think that it's really apt here because it, it's it's difficult to describe the emotions of isolation and shoddiness with diction in a way that is comprehensible mm. right because because he uses the images we can visually perceive the the you know kind of off way that everything feels but if you were to use if you were to try and use words to convey that then you'd probably end up with some bizarre grammatically incorrect language that just kind of hurts your brain to read hmm. and so i think he chose to use pictures instead because they're a better medium to allow our brain to perceive the sensations that are trying to be evoked yeah i think i think the paintings and the the pictures and the way that it's formatted, it almost makes makes you slow down. And it, that feels intentional. It feels like he really wants each word to resonate with the reader. Um, and so you can really feel something. So yeah, I totally agree with you. Going off of that, why do you think this piece is so powerful? Because when I read this, I almost, I almost wanted to cry when I finished. And it's, it's so short. It took me like maybe 10 seconds to read, but it's, it's just so, it's so sad. Um, there's, there, there's so many complicated emotions going on. Why is that, especially relating to the things going on in the world today? Why does it make us so sad to read something like this? I think it's because right now in the world, most people have this kind of sensation of isolation and diffidence towards the rest of the population and this story puts that sense of isolation in the perspective of a person who has always felt that way and i think that you know as a, a social uh, species of mammals we we kind of need that isolation and the prospect of living our entire life like this guy, like we live our life, like we've lived our life for the past seven months. The prospect of living like that forever, uh, for an indeterminate amount of time at least, is saddening and frightful. And this story does a really good job of taking the current situation, which all of us feel very vividly, and applying it to a broader spectrum of time to a very specific group of people who live like this hmm. all the time. And so it, it kind of, it makes us mourn their disconnectedness because we suddenly realize, my God, there are actually people that live like this all the time. Mm -hmm. And just that prospect is one that's very saddening. I feel like the the one of the main arguments of this piece is that just because you live alone doesn't mean that this virus isn't something that you're terrified of. Um, and, and and he mentions, you know, that that he's he's been alone. His whole life, yeah, he's been socially distanced for the last 20 years, but the virus still terrifies him. Um, and so that's, uh, it's a powerful way of, of reminding people that the virus is not something that's normal and no one is taking it easy. Even someone that um, may be a, a little more adept to uh, dealing with things on their own. Um, but I want to bring it back to a quote that the author made. He says he says two things. He says this um, this piece is for adults, 
and he says that the pictures do the heavy lifting. These two are related, and I wanted to talk about how he achieves um, he achieves this. How does he make a picture book for adults, and how does he use uh, those pictures to convey the most powerful emotions? I think that, you know, not contrary to the statement, but kind of to contrast it, the, the way that it works is probably rooted in everybody's childhood, right? Because when you're a child is when you read the most picture books, and it's also when you have the most definitive emotions, mm. right? And like back when you're, you know, five, you're not dealing with emotions of, of melancholy and, you know, guilt. When you're five, you're, you're dealing with, you know, happy, sad, mm. afraid, disgusted. Right. You're dealing with very broad, specific emotions at that age. And I think that he achieves a message for adults by using the pictures to convey simple, broad emotions about an adult topic, mm. right? And so the, the, the pictures carry the brunt of the weight because it, it dredges up memories in adults' heads of, you know, times when things were more black and white and, you know, there was less... Uh, like dependency on scenario. Sure. And so I think that the, the pictures serve to just kind of create this broad feeling of sadness that, you know, no, a, adults don't normally feel because normally that feeling of sadness is compounded with everything else, but it, it really serves to to kind of reel in because because adults tend to overthink things hmm. um and and so this uses uh child's book tactics to an uh, adult scenario to kind of reel in the thought process of the reader and like you said slow it down and make it more deliberate okay I would like, and I, I really like what you said there, um, about, man, the, the pictures are just so um, unclear. They're, they're not specific. Now, in this, this picture here, you can see, um, uh, you can see two hands, uh, different skin tones. One has a watch on, the other has what appears to be a bracelet. The watch is detailed. But the hand is not. Um, just like the bracelet is also not detailed. We can tell it's a bracelet. It's not a specific bracelet. So that part of the memory is fogged, which is also cool. Because this picture, these pictures, these illustrations, represent kind of the way we remember old memories. Which is why I think this is so powerful. It's because we don't remember full pictures as memories. We remember specific parts of those pictures with finer detail. So every one of these pictures has layered complex details. Um, for example, I remember the wallpaper of my first, my childhood home really well. Just like this next, this picture here, the wallpaper is very, very detailed. Uh -huh. uh, it draws your attention to the wallpaper. It makes you feel, I don't know, that feeling of this is a memory. Not necessarily like this is happening, that this is a memory that you're remembering these specific textures and everything else is foggy. I think that's beautiful. Right. Well, going back to the image about, you know, the river pushing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I feel like I'm looking at a Rorschach inkblot test right now. Uh-huh. Okay. You look at this image and you see there's two hands, one of them's got a watch on, one of them's got a bracelet on. All right. I want to I want to do something, all right? I want you to look at the watch. Okay. I'm looking and at I the want watch. You to see it as a face. Okay. Like with and hair. Okay. With yeah, yeah. Hair. The hair. And the arm shooting off to the left. Okay. And there's a rather buxom woman 
stretching out below it. All right. And then in the middle of the hand, where there's that strange discoloration, that's a face. It's a dude with some, you know, hair parted down the middle. He's got a really pointy chin and a really big nose. Right? And, well, I'm just saying, you, you look at this image and you see two people holding hands and they could be any person. Sure. I look at this and I see a guy walking away from a girl. Really? And I, when I look, when I, I didn't see that bracelet as a bracelet. I saw that as a traffic light. That's fascinating. I didn't know what the tan blotches were. I didn't see that they were hands that were holding each other. I just, mm. I saw a man walking away from a woman on a busy street. I wanted to talk to you a little more about imagery, actually. So obviously this piece has like tons and tons of packed imagery. We're only going to be able to get to a couple things. The first thing that I wanted to get to is the blue sky. Why? He goes from, he goes from, the virus is frightening. He starts with, I, lockdown should feel like normal life. The virus is frightening. The news is even worse. I do love how clear the blue sky is. Um, first of all, why? Second of all, this entire page is blue, and all of the other ones are um, are this this like sepia tone that that is this constant. And and it, this one takes this picture takes up the whole page, whereas the other ones don't. So there's so many things going on in this picture. Uh, why the sky? What's going on? Well, I think it's notable that. This is a guy who lives in some urban area in the UK. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's probably implied that there's probably some pretty heavy smog that goes on from all the cars that are driving any, everywhere. Mm -hmm. But now that there are no cars because there are no... You know, there's no cars because there, nobody needs to go anywhere because everyone's isolating at home. The there's less smog in the sky, and the sky appears more blue. Hmm. And I think that he makes this transition right because uh, he says, "But the virus is frightening, and the news is even worse." Those things don't really affect him much. Hmm. His life is already his life is already social distancing, so he doesn't have to go out of his way to change that aspect of his life. And the news is always somewhat distant, but the the color of the sky when it changes is very noticeable and it's very present in your life because it's it's just this kind of omnipresent experience that the, the sky is a certain color, and when the sky's color suddenly changes, then it feels like the entirety of your existence has altered. Like, imagine if you went outside and the sky was magenta. Okay. Right? Everything would suddenly take on this kind of magical tone to it, and everyone would be, you know, talking in hushed, whispered tones about the magenta sky. Mm. and you know, it, it's personal. Everybody experiences it. And it's something that has changed for him. Mm. And so I think that's why the, the blue sky is so significant is because it's something that has actually altered in his life mm -hmm. and it has altered for the better. Interesting. Uh, uh, while you were saying that, I realized that this person lives in Britain. Do you know how often they get blue skies in Britain, Clayton? Not very often. Not very it's often. Usually cold, gray, and rainy. And I doubt, I doubt the sky has been blue all the time since COVID happened. So it feels like it, this represents something that is not permanent. It's something that he's seeing in the moment. And it's something that he's using to take his mind off of the news and the virus. So far, he's been telling us 
things going on, right? The words tell us the things that he's feeling, the, the stuff that's going on. Right. This is the first instance where he's showing us his, his mental state, right? What, what profession can you go into where you don't touch anybody for, he, like, over he a could, decade? He could be working from home. He might be retired. Maybe, maybe he's a writer. Maybe he writes books. I don't know. Um, meta. Right. And when I was reading this, I wasn't sure if this is the author speaking, like as in the person that actually wrote this this piece, or if he's making a character. And the more I read it, the more I think it's a character, but it also feels very inspired by events that are actually happening. So what do you what do you think the um where's the line? Like is this more of him, the author, or more of like a character he's created? I feel like in order to answer that question, I need to know more about uh -huh. the author. Right. Um, is he known as a recluse that doesn't really leave his home? Or is he known as a, a social guy that goes to book signings and reads his stories to little kids, et cetera, et cetera? True. Perhaps this is a part of him. Hmm. Because, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I, I feel like I'm comprised of you know not multiple personalities but there are multiple aspects to my character yeah and i think that this is perhaps a, a specific uh perception of self that the author has right because you know sometimes i i perceive myself as a a vivid politician and other times i view myself as a a successful actor and other times i view myself as a a studious academic and all of those things are me and yet i am none of those things yes and or so, you might be an interviewee on a podcast or something i might be an interviewee on a podcast that is named after me yes due to an inside joke in language class Yes. Um, but it, I, I feel like this is just a part of the author that he's expressing here. It's the part of the author that comes out when he, probably when he sits down to actually write. Authors isolate themselves when they write to prevent themselves from experiencing distractions. And I think that the theme of isolation is kind of prominent here. And um, I think that this is just the part of the, the author's psyche that emerges when he sits down to just write a book. Mm. This character is talking to you as if you should already know some things about him. Like, you know, those boys that pushed me into the river, like, this this feels like this that that should be a whole other story. Uh, please do elaborate about the boys that pushed you into the river. Um, is this a reference to something that I didn't read? Like that's those are the things that cross my mind. Um, what do you think about these super fine details? Perhaps the author's writing them in the hopes that it because they're super specific and yet super vague at the same time. It's like the, um, you know, the uh, P.T. Barnum effect? Uh-huh. Yeah. So, you know, like when you have a personality test and then you like answer all these questions, and then it gives you like a, you're intelligent but resourceful and you don't huh. really rely on other people too much. And it's just a bunch of stuff that seems really specific, but it's actually pretty vague. And so what I think the author is might be doing with these specific details is he's probably banking off of the idea that you know everyone kind of has had a, a bullying experience where they were pushed into the river mm. right yeah or they have a very vivid recollection of an interaction with somebody mm. that stands out in their head but it's not actually that significant and they don't really know why and so hmm. I think that the inclusion of the boys pushing me into the river and the 
the woman who he touched in 2008, uh, it, 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 it serves to make the character more relatable, but also more specific, right? So mm -hmm. it makes the reader more inclined to feel special that they can relate to the the character because they're like wow this character is very you know specific they've had these experiences but i've had similar experiences too man i i really connect with this story but you know in reality it's everybody that experiences that yeah okay you know what i've just noticed what do you what did you notice I, yeah the the image of the the train or the bus or whatever the the public transport image there's that Here? one no. woman whose dress is no, made up of magazine clippings there right it is. It's yes. the, yeah I, I think that's a very subtle detail but it, it i don't know about you but whenever i go in public transportation i tend to just watch one person <laughs> okay yeah 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 i, I see that and I think that's just another, you know, point to this thing that we've been discussing is how, you know, it's it it's like subliminally making the character more relatable because, you know, when I'm on the, oh, this person only sees one person when they're on public transport, the same thing happens with me. Wow. We're he's, so similar. He's doing an excellent job of of representing the way we as humans remember certain things and i've said this before but it's just fascinating every single picture somehow m looks more like a memory to me than an actual picture which is just crazy 11 12 13 okay 13 pages three of those 13 pages clayton three of them and he only has 13 pages three of them are dedicated to a goat why why is there a goat it's a deer. Looks like a goat. <laughs> no, it's it's not very well drawn, is it? None of them are dedicated to a goat. It's definitely a deer. It, 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 says, it says it's a deer. deer. It does I say saw it. a deer by the co-op. Why why a deer, Clayton? Why why does he talk about a deer? And why does it look so much like a goat? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think it looks like a goat because of its coloration. See, goats tend to have um, more traditional livestock colors, which okay, are whites, you. browns, blacks, and grays. Uh, and deers are more traditionally brown and red colored. <laughs> and because this deer has absolutely no features whatsoever, and it's just a white and gray blob, <laughs> it's more like a goat. It almost looks like a cutout, actually. Like there's yeah. a there's a rim around it. Why do you think there is a goat? Why? Why a? Add it again, Clayton. <laughs> Clayton, why? Why is there a deer? Why is there a deer here on this page? Well, <sighs> okay. Um, I understand the deer in the first image where he's like i saw a deer by the co-op because i think it's got something similar to do with the blue sky mm -hmm. right there's no cars there's less pollution there's less people and so wildlife is starting to come back to the urban regions it's like when the dolphins went back to venice in mm -hmm. italy um and you know we we take it for granted because we live in like kind of a, a quasi rural area and we see wildlife pretty much all the time dumpleton pride <laughs> yeah like you know I, i'll see i'll see deer from my backyard every couple of weeks it, it it's not a bizarre occurrence for us but for people who live in the concrete jungle it, it it's to see an animal other than a human, a bird, a dog, or a cat mm -hmm. is like, oh my gosh, that's a living, moving thing with free will, and it's not domesticated, and it's big enough to do something. Yep, yes. Wow. Yes, a deer, not a goat, deer, 
is big enough to do something. I have a hypothesis on this one, actually. Okay. But why does the deer and the author stare at each other for a long time? Because they're surprised to see each other. Mm. The deer is like, oh, wow, there's no people. Cool. I'm just going to clop around this empty town. There's a dude over there. Hmm. And the dude's like, I'm going to go to the co-op and buy myself some groceries. There's a deer over there. Yes. And they stared at each other like that. Now, Clayton, I'm going to suggest something, and it might be crazy, but bear with me. Sometimes in literature, when two things stare at each other, and it's significant, and they bring it up, sometimes those two things share a, an intimate connection that the two aren't aware of. Perhaps the deer represents something other than a deer. Might be crazy. But the I deer might represent maybe that guy. Go. What do you think? So you're telling me that the deer is symbolic of him. It's a it's a deer and then Clayton, they talk about COVID for the first what ten pages? And then the last three they're talking about deers. I, I, I don't know. What 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 would your explanation be? I, I'm thinking that the deer is probably s somehow related to that that guy. Well, then that guy's got a really messed up family tree, Thomas. I'm not so sure about that. Um, here's, here's what I thought when I first saw the deer. Okay. The first thing I felt was confusion. Yes. Yep. No, no. The first thing I felt was, okay, he's a, he's a city boy. He hasn't seen a deer in a while. He's a bit surprised. Okay. Yes. Then the deer appeared in his hallway. Right. Yes. And then I felt confusion. Right. And thinking to myself i suppose there is a possibility of the connection between them because neither of them really belong hmm. neither of them are particularly suited for the environment which they find themselves in and so they find themselves relating to each other but i think that it that the presence of the deer as a confusing element kind of serves to emphasize the the surreality of the entire covid lockdown scenario hmm. i feel like that same sense of bizarre oddness is one that kind of pervades our existence in this covid melodrama interesting and so i think that the reason the deer is there is to just kind of activate that final like notch in in synthesizing because this this piece does an excellent job of synthesizing all of the emotions related to the quarantine and pandemic mm -hmm. etc and i think that that deer kind of unlocks the final piece and it it, it it's there's not so much significance in that it's a deer there's just significance in the the surreal experience which the deer provides. You know what what famous work of literature I'm reminded of? I'm thinking of the Harry Potter saga. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. The 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 Patronus, um Patronus the Patronus, stag Patronus. The stag Patronus. And that's why I feel like this deer is kind of like like a spirit animal or like a representation of the character's mental state because that's kind of what a patronus is and this feels an awful lot like a patronus um yeah man i i it's just so confusing that like if it'd be one thing if he mentioned that he saw the deer at the cooperative like he mentions that the sky is blue good great uh he mentions that the the streets are clear then he says there's a deer by the co-op and sure okay the the Wildlife is more comfortable coming here because there's less people. 
then he sees it everywhere. I'm thinking he saw this deer and it made it, it represented something bigger and important to him. And now he sees this as an image, a symbol everywhere he goes. So somehow this deer went from being a deer to now it's a symbol for him, specific to him, that he sees in his everyday life. What could that symbol possibly be? Well, he says that the, he thinks the deer is protecting him. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's a, a symbol of the natural order of things mm -hmm. and how they, they tend to just kind of work out. You know, in nature, <laughs> there's a lot of turbulence that occurs, mm -hmm. you know, like mm -hmm. a a volcano will erupt or there'll be a tsunami or a hurricane will strike, but eventually everything just kind of goes back to normal. Sometimes it takes time, but everything kind of falls back to that equilibrium point. And I think that that deer is, maybe it's symbolic to him because he's like, maybe he's thinking that, that humans are the turbulent force and that, you know, eventually will be gone and the deers will reclaim the, the city. Oh, no. And then... Oh, dear. Then... <laughs> keep going, keep going, keep going. <laughs> you did not just say, oh, dear. Oh, Thomas. <laughs> uh... Oh, goat. <laughs> it's protecting him from the throes of urban society. So I think that this last... His last point is that such a stupid thing to think is kind of calling to people who have similar experiences like that. And like, you know what? No, it's not a stupid thing to think because now I know that other people do it as well. I'd like to ask you one final question about this piece. And, right. I, and that is, what is his argument? Why did he write this piece? I think this piece exists because this author has a lot of bottled up feelings and he wanted to express them because authors are artists. Mm -hmm. They're artists of the word. And in certain cases such as this, they can also be illustrators mm -hmm. and painters, etc. I don't particularly feel like there's a, a, a message or a moral that he's trying to foist upon us. I think he's just trying to express how he feels about all of this. And he's probably hoping to reach other people who are also feeling like that so that they know that they are not alone. Clayton, do you have any concluding thoughts or, or statements to make about this piece? Do you like this, the choice that I made? It, it is a very good choice. I, I did enjoy analyzing this piece further. It's, like I said before, it's bizarre, it's odd, it's very interpretable. Um, I, I'm going to be honest, I feel a little bit underwhelmed by it it, it just kind of <laughs> it, it despite how short it is it still somehow comes across as a little bit pedantic hmm. to me the speed isn't the problem it's the pace and okay. i know those things seem analogous to one another but you know the speed is just how you know quickly you process the information but the pace is how dynamic it feels and this thing feels really plodding yeah because that that's one of the things that i i feel they missed about the pandemic is while it, it feels slow it also feels a bit chaotic right hmm. and i think they missed that feeling of chaos because you know one of the things that i like to say is 
you know, I can't believe, you know, I can't believe it's already no November. It only feels like 23 months have gone by. Uh -huh. Okay. It, it, it's simultaneously like things have gone by really quickly and I can't quite comprehend how fast they've gone by, but it's also, oh, we've been here forever. Uh-huh. And. Feels like running in place. Yeah. So they've got the running in place portion down but they don't have the speed at which things are happening. But I think that this piece especially does a good job of capturing maybe what it feels like for, uh, for someone older or maybe retired, uh, what they're going through in this pandemic. Maybe it isn't so fast for them. You know, it's fast for us because we're in school and we have to do all these things. And, uh, but right. maybe time stands still for him. So, um, I don't know. I think it captures the way he feels really well. Yeah, I, I, I enjoyed it. I was a little bit underwhelmed by it. But I think overall, it's a very well constructed piece of literature. That's the first episode of the podcast, you guys. Thank you for watching. The link yeah. to this uh, piece of literature is going to be in the description. Uh, it's called Social Distance, a Graphic Story for the Coronavirus Age by Mark Haddon. I'm Thomas. This is Clayton. This has been The Clayton Perspective.